I lived across the street from Harold for more than a decade. It's amazing what you see about people when you catch swaths of their life in passing. It was never that I intended to watch him or anything like that. This was merely a matter of living near him. I was there when they had the movers, when they renovated their house, and when they became just Harold. It was a dark morning with thick moisture in the air that served to let everyone know of the approaching storm. I was fighting off a cold of epic proportions, chewing lemon cough drops like candies and drinking cup after cup of peppermint tea. The mixture of these flavors tasted awful, but at least I could taste something. It wasn't very often that I'd call out of work like that, so I guess it was purely dumb luck that made it so I saw him across the street. Even being sick, I tried downing a few slices of toast just so I'd have something in my stomach. This made it so I ended up reading Reddit on my phone while nibbling on the edge of a piece of burnt toast. There was Harold, rushing across his lawn with his robe hanging open to expose his white briefs, dead-eyed with scuff growing around his throat. He bent down to lift the newspaper at the end of his driveway and shook it from the plastic bag that had collected the morning's moisture. After thumbing through it, some fit overtook him and he began ripping the paper till it all fluttered away on the wind, catching along sidewalk crags or bush branches like flags signaling his surrender. I felt for the man, honestly. I'd seen the whole thing when Patricia stomped across the lawn over there and peeled out of the driveway. We all liked her. Most people that brought sweets to welcome people to the neighborhood could be overbearing with their niceties. But she had a way with it that made everyone comfortable. I could only imagine the misery Harold was living with. Rumor said that it was an ongoing thing, as these things tend to be. A culmination of symptoms till they had to be exercised from each other. People tried getting Harold to come out to functions, but he said no a lot after she left. Poor fellow was taking it exceptionally hard. I watched him as he moved back to his front door and slammed it shut behind him. By the time I'd given up on the toast, Harold poked his head back out the door and peered around to make sure no one was watching him. The coast was clear, or so he thought, because I could see him well enough. He went chasing after the strands of paper he left behind, this time taking precautions to tie his robe shut. I remember thinking then how weird a grief that must be to lose someone like that. Makes you do weird shit. As for me, I've enjoyed my own company too much to muddy the waters with anything beyond platonic. Once he'd collected most of them, he trod out of sight once more, giving me enough time to look at a few more wholesome memes and finish my cup of tea. Finally, at some point that I'd not even seen, because I'd become so engrossed in my scrolling, Harold was in his yard between the two maples, angled against a spade with effort. Even from a distance, I could see that the morning sprinkle was making quick work of his bedhead, so it conformed to the shape of his skull. My brain took minutes to realize what he was doing, but as the pile of wet earth beside him grew, it registered. But why? What the hell was he thinking? Was he planting something? I watched him like that for at least half an hour, sipping through two cups of tea. He was in the hole halfway up his shins and caked in mud. As I polished off the last cup, I moved to grab my umbrella and stepped outside. Harold didn't even look up at me as I stood in front of him. He was a man possessed. Groans escaped him each time he drove the spade into the ground. But as his loafered foot came down on the foothold and his arms pried to jimmy the dirt loose so he could toss it to the side, he let out a satisfied grunt. Standing there on the sidewalk, just on the other side of his hedge, with the rain coming down light, I looked on. Whether or not he noticed me, he did not make it known. Hey there, buddy. What are you doing there? How are you, neighbor, you know? He asked me without even looking up from his work. It came from him like a jaunty, self-aware joke. Um, another shovelful met the pile. Do you need me to call someone? He laughed and continued shoveling. For a minute, it seemed like he wasn't going to respond to my question. Clay. I jumped at the sound of my own name coming from his mouth. You're a nice guy. He spat and wiped his forehead, leaning against the handle of the spade. At least he'd stopped digging, if nothing else. His eyes were lucid like he'd never before been alive. 
and it was only now that it had found him. Or maybe he was just fucking crazy. I used to make these little ships. You've seen them before, right? Whenever Patty threw her parties, I'd show them off. I'm sure I've shown you before, haven't I? They were in the bottles. He put out his hands to demonstrate the size of the bottles. I nodded. You see, making those little ships is a real pain. For me, the hardest part was always raising the mast. I hated building those things. But that's what I was supposed to do, right? Does that make sense? He gestured to the house behind him. I've got really shaky hands, so putting those tiny pieces in just the right places always drove me straight up the wall. You understand. It was rough, but whenever I'd finish one, I'd carefully take it to wherever Patty was in the house and show it to her. She loved those fucking things. They were cute, she'd say, or, or some variant thereof. It's cliche, but it was happiness, too, and that's what I always wanted, this. Again, another manic gesture to the house. It was the American dream they tell you about before your balls drop, kiddo. Do this, get this degree, buy this house. Marry this lady because she makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside, then... Poof. One day it's all gone, and... Do you know what you have to do then? I shook my head. It was early autumn and the air was giving me chills. Or maybe Harold was. You gotta smash those fucking bottles. You have to, you know, because it makes you feel something. You throw them across the room, you watch them explode like... <sighs> so many hours. He shook his head and laughed. I'll tell you, man, those things were a lot more fun that way. Felt good and bad at the same time. Cathartic? I said. I guess, man, whatever you want to call it. But that's what you gotta do sometimes. He looked at the hole he was standing in and then at the yard as a whole. White picket fence my ass. But Harold. Yeah. You don't have a fence. He cut his eyes at me, but slowly a smirk started to slice across the lower half of his face until it evolved into a hearty chuckle. Thanks, I needed that. Sometimes you gotta dig a hole. I asked. Harold snapped his finger. Goddamn right! I can't explain exactly what it was that jumped into me at that moment. Looking back on it, it's the most indescribable sensation. I looked back to my house across the street beneath my umbrella in the dreary rain and even in the cool weather. I could feel fire in the pit of my stomach. Perhaps he infected me with his madness, but I'd rather state my case as this. Sometimes you gotta dig a hole. Because that's what feels right. Splashing through puddles as I ran through the rain toward the shed in my backyard, I found my old worn-out shovel. It was rusted from years of disuse. I bolted back towards Harold's, forgetting my umbrella completely. I must have lost my mind. Running around in the rain with a cold to go and dig a hole with my neighbor. When I say it aloud, it sounds insane. But when you're in the moment, things are different. I jumped into the small hole he'd created and began chipping away at the edges and loosening the dirt so we'd have a wider area for us both to work comfortably in. He said nothing to me as I joined. My tired, cold-riddled body ached with each passing moment, but then something else joined it. I've heard people talk about getting a runner's high from pushing beyond your limit. And that seems as good an explanation as any other. The light rain gave way to a sunny midday lull, as each shovel push felt less like the last and more like we were doing something important. It couldn't have been a few hours or only minutes before I looked up to examine my surroundings. Regardless, when I did look up from the ground, we'd cleared out enough dirt so we were standing in the hole up to our waist. Harold continued his digging, but I took a moment to catch my breath. And when I did, I heard a familiar voice say, Clay, what are you doing? I looked up. Standing in nearly the same spot as I had been earlier that morning, 
There was Rogers and Margaret. Rogers was a man in his mid-thirties who wore sweaters everywhere and walked his dog around the neighborhood to shit on other people's lawns. In fact, in his right hand, it was a leash drawn taut as the little mutt most likely watered Harold's hedges, hidden in the leaves. Margaret, on the other hand, was an elderly runner. In her bright, sick green and purple sweats, she hardly got any workout. If you ask me, I think she just went around the neighborhood hoping to catch or dish the latest gossip. I grinned at the two of them. You know how it is. Sometimes you gotta dig. You're more than welcome to join us if you'd like. They looked at one another and then back at me. This time Margaret spoke. What are you digging for? Digging for? I thought the question over for a moment. We're not looking for anything, if that's what you mean. Harold, I turned to look at my compatriot for support. Tell them what you were telling me earlier. Harold barely looked up as he heaved another hunk of moist dirt out of the hole. It's all bogus. You work for things. You want to be loved and to love in return. And that's where you mess up because you should have been doing that to yourself the whole time. And not searching for it in someone else. Then he sighed and looked up while leaning against the shovel handle. What I'm trying to say is, there's no reason to dig. But focusing on the task at hand sure does let my mind wander. Who needs therapy? It's expensive, and you could have been digging all along. Digging for the truth. It might look like dirt and roots to you, but to me this is where I'm figuring my shit out. As the two of them listened to him, I could see the light in their eyes return, and it felt once more like they were humans with a spark of initiative, and not plain, boring suburbanites. Rogers wiped his hair back in contemplation, totally messing up the perfect widow's peak he'd developed. He lifted his dog and ran down the sidewalk, screaming over his shoulder, I'll be right back! I watched him go for a moment, then shifted my attention to Margaret, but she too was gone. When the two of them returned, I was not surprised. What did surprise me, however, is that while Rogers showed up with a shovel on his shoulder like a rifle, Margaret came jogging back with a wheelbarrow full of tools. Shovels, axes, pickaxes. Among the things she brought was a gas-powered auger, and I must admit that did surprise me quite a bit. There was a feverish tinge in her face, one that said she meant business. I swear when Harold heard the auger fire up, he grinned from ear to ear. It was contagious. It felt like the deeper we got, we were compelled by an external force of some kind. Whispers from just around the corners of our faces. Everyone began talking about it. Our team of four quickly grew to ten, then twenty, then thirty by the time the people started getting off work drove by. Babysitters were called for those that had children. When asked how long they'd be gone, they did not give an answer and doubled the pay. Terry, Roger's husband, showed up at the hole, trying to urge him to drop this craziness. But it wasn't long till he found himself in the hole digging along with the rest of us. We hacked the maples to pieces in the yard and moved those pieces into the street. By the time it was getting too dark to dig, Linus, a single dad, hauled over his grill and started cooking hamburgers and hot dogs for the tired diggers. It got to the point that when I was standing in the hole, the top was nearly 15 feet over my head. The diameter was at least 25 feet. We lounged, dirt-covered but smiling and joking and talking about the weather, as we ate and cracked open a few beers. If not for the massive hole in Harold's front yard, it may have been a regular cookout. Gathering together string lights on poles and tiki torches, we brought the yard alive and setting up plastic sunbathing chairs to bed down for the night. What was the plan for that? I'd say it was obvious. All of us had the intention of continuing the project the following morning. I caught sight of Harold near the sidewalk, peering down into the hole. He sipped from a beer bottle, and a little satisfied smile played out on his face. On approach, he greeted me with a simple nod. Sure is something, isn't it? I said. That it is. Can't believe we made it this far. How long do you think it'll take till we can't go anymore? He said. I glanced at the gathered crowd, falling asleep in plastic chairs or chatting amongst themselves in groups of three or four at a time. I've heard people joking that they won't stop till we hit China. That's the sort of stuff only kids talk about. 
I think it's magical that full-grown people can play pretend like that. There was a pause as I too stared into the pit, admiring it in all its glory. We've certainly done a good thing here, haven't we? Certainly. Harold took a quick swig of his beer. This is fucking crazy. He laughed. He had a tired look in his eye that I could sympathize with. You should go home and get some rest. He checked the watch on his wrist. If we hope to make an impact tomorrow, we should start early. I put up two fingers and gave him a lazy, jokey salute. Good night. Night. Never before in my life have I slept like I did that night. It wasn't just the tiredness or my cold either, if I were to guess. In black dreams, I heard what can only be described as electric bubbles in my ears. The screeching in the night filled me and hollowed me out, same as we did that pit. It was a nightmare. I, I should say that much, but it was so much more than that. The best way I could put it is that it felt like... It felt as though my soul, even if I'd never been one to believe in such a thing before, was leaving my body. And I was a nothing person. Less than human for it. Then the screeching in my dreams woke me and I realized that I was not hearing the sounds of dreams, but the sounds of screams. I propelled myself off the chair and staggered around, bleary-eyed. It was still night or early morning. What's happening? I tried screaming. My neighbors were running towards the pit and there was already a crowd of them gathered at its edge. I followed, slapping my face awake. As I came to the edge of the hole among the others, I froze. There was a place at the opposite end of the pit where the dirt floor had given out to some unknowable chamber. From it sprang forth whipping, glistening tendrils, bright red and thin as paperclip wire. Each one writhed independently from the others, but must have come together on the end of some great unseen beast in the dirt. Several of them held Rogers well over our heads as I looked on with extraordinary horror at what I was seeing. The tendrils cracked like whips against his body, sending out shrill, pus-curdling screams. They shed him out of his clothes and then began stripping from his skin as well. My eyes shot to Terry. He looked on entirely helpless at what was happening. I could see the frozen tears in his eyes, not quite accepting what was in front of his face. All our faces. I saw it and I can tell you still that I have dreams of it or... Sometimes I will try to tell myself that it was all some fever image from my cold. But I know that's not true. It's impossible to retract. Rogers, more red runny muscles and exposed bone than anything else, hardly looked like a human anymore. The tendrils lifted him ever higher and twisted his body like a rag, then dropped him dead before recoiling into their subterranean lair. The hole in the pit that went deeper place it had spawned from echoed a gurgle to signify that the chamber was large, exceptionally large. Terry screamed finally, taking towards one of the ladders protruding from the hole. Margaret tried reaching for him, but he was too fast. In moments he was in the pit on his knees before his husband. I couldn't bear to watch him cry over Rogers like that and started scanning the area for Harold, but he was gone. Instead, my eyes fell on the flaps of skin that caught along the crags on the sidewalk and the debris we'd created in our endeavor to dig our fucking way to China. They flapped like flags in the wind. I couldn't help it. I stepped from the hole and kneeled over, throwing up the hot dogs I'd had earlier. A few people joined me. By the time I wiped the muck from around my mouth and looked back up, Terry was already at the ladder again, at the bottom of the pit and screaming at somebody, anybody to help him as he carried Roger's corpse in tow. He was covered in his husband's blood. One of the corpse's legs moved across the ground like a piece of bald lint on the end of a string. Then I heard the noise from my dreams. It was maddening. It seemed to be coming from inside my own head like a musical popping. It sent a shiver down my spine. At some point tears began to flow as I looked on the crowd of gathered faces and I could tell that they heard it too. And we all knew what it meant. We marched towards the ladders, pressed around the edges of the hole, our feet no longer our own, each of us with a tool in our hands. Terry dropped the corpse and began walking towards the place the dirt had opened up, just as we all did. We were going in, totally transfixed. 
I remember looking at the faces that came along, and I could not help but notice that Harold was not among them. I wondered briefly if he had the sense to run away when he had the chance. As we filed into the chamber, one by one, the slanted dirt of the cave-in made for arduous moving. It must have taken us down another hundred feet at least. Finally, our feet met with solid stone. In the distance, there was a city of spires and ancient stone, with firelight snapping intermittently. There was no logical reasoning for its existence. Seeing that place from even as far away as we did, I felt a sense of dread. I was sick. I was tired. And I was shaking from the existential horror before us. The city in the distance, beneath the impossibly high ceiling of the cavern, called us nearer. Among my neighbors, there were whispers of the most unfathomable possibilities. As we moved along, carrying tiki torches and pickaxes, wet schlepping sounds came from overhead. And as we peered over our own heads to see what creature it was coming from, the ropey red tendrils of the thing that had killed Rogers dangled from the flat ceiling. The ropey limbs of the thing hung from its bulbous, fat body. It seemed to be breathing, but otherwise did not move. As Margaret removed the flashlight from her person and shone her light around, it became obvious that the ceiling was covered in those monstrosities, spaced out from one another by about twenty yards. Jesus Christ, said Linus. I can't believe this has been under our feet this whole goddamn time. I don't think this was under our feet, I said. Hearing it aloud like that, it made too much sense. You'd have thought we would have heard these eldritch horrors kicking around before then. I don't think this place was here before. What the fuck are you talking about? Linus cut his eyes at me, the fire from his tiki torch illuminating his face. He was scared, I could see it. I just mean, I think we did this. Margaret interjected. Look! Our eyes followed where she pointed, and I felt a shiver run up my spine. Up the way, through boulders and sharp debris, we caught sight of watchers patrolling from the edge of the city. Twig spider legs that bowed out with each step from atop round seats with spotlights scanning the area. The detail of them from so far away was blurred, but I can promise you that they looked like monstrosities ripped from a Beksinki painting. What are those? Even as I spoke the words, I knew that no living human could have looked upon them before because every aspect of their anatomy seemed to defy all understanding. Seeing them made me so uneasy that I reached out for one of my neighbors in the dark so that I might have someone to hold on to. What are they? I repeated. Let go of me! Daryl, a devout member of the neighborhood watch, slapped my hand away. I offered him a weak smile. I'm sorry, I've, just, I've never seen anything like it. None of us have, it's... Phantasmagorical, I said, totally awestruck. Daryl and Margaret both looked at me funny and responded by simply peering ahead at the watchers. We walked as we did, and I began to feel the cold I'd been suffering from prior begin to take hold over me. My nose began to run, my muscles ached, and I sniffled. I believed that working in the rain the previous day had done little to improve my situation. No one mentioned it, but I kept glancing overhead at the stringy things dangling from the ceiling wondering if they could hear the noises I was making. My mind continuously went back to the way they'd utterly destroyed Rogers, and I could not help but shudder to think what they might do to me. How much longer till you think we've reached them? I asked Linus. No one answered him. The echo of the infinite-seeming chamber was the only thing. It seemed that we went on for perhaps hours, slipping or tumbling across the bent, moist rocks that the floor became, as we neared the city of spires. All the while, those unnameable beasts overhead never left our visage. Whimpers escaped from the crowd when we passed by one, edging around the limbs while giving them a wide berth. One of the tendrils curled on itself, sending a shrill cry from Linus. The thing took little notice of us, and we hurried along. The outline of the city ahead became even more clear. It feels like we've been walking forever. I said. Whether this was due to the fact that I was more tuckered than the others, or it was that we had trod over the rough terrain for a vast, immeasurable time, I couldn't tell. 
we met a great rock face that stabbed towards the ceiling. It seemed our best bet at finding a place to rest, and I mentioned it in passing. With grumbles over how we should continue moving dispersed, we sat with our backs to the flat surface of the rock. The others, too, began to express discontent with our journey. We never should have come here, hushed Margaret. Daryl scanned the surroundings from a position atop a waist-high boulder. I can't remember where the exit is. I don't think we can go back. The exit doesn't exist anymore. The anxiety in his voice crept up my spine. It was true. Why had none of us thought to leave behind guideposts for the journey back? Or was it that we had collectively accepted our fate and subconsciously decided none of us were going to leave anyways? I sat against the rock among a few half-familiar faces. That's not possible, said Margaret. She moved to the rock he was standing on, reaching up a hand. He hoisted her bony frame up, her gray hair catching around her face. As she swiped it back, she pivoted in all directions. That's the city. We've come in a straight line. It should be somewhere over there. She pointed an inconsequential finger towards the dark shadows. Right? Daryl shook his head. Why have we come here? The teary madness was evident in his tone, but I was too tired to look up from my seated position against the big rock. I stared at the ground and wished I had something to blow my nose into. The others began setting up a makeshift camp, positioning torches and stone cracks and lying out jackets to sit on. When I finally did look up again, I could see that Margaret and Daryl moved from their position on the rock and took up among the others. The ceiling, alien and starless with those monsters, made me uneasy. I spent my time counting the people in our camp. Twenty-eight scared faces. Each of them looking wearily over their shoulders at every small noise. Margaret moved from person to person, and when she came to ask me if I was feeling all right, I shrugged it off. She left me and continued roaming the camp with her hands on her hips scanning further vicinities. Margaret pulled a hairband from her wrist and pulled her hair back into a ponytail. For a long moment I was surprised at just how agile and full of energy the old bird was. Perhaps those daily walks through the neighborhood were paying off for. I wish I'd felt the same in that moment. After glancing around to make sure no one else was watching me, I quickly took the long sleeve of my shirt and blew my nose into it. A few people looked my way, but quickly went back to whatever conversations they were having. I was so tired. Rubbing my temples, I rose to my feet and moved to the same rock that Margaret and Daryl had been standing on. After shifting myself slowly up, I began to look around. Near the city, perhaps a mile away, were the watchers with the spotlights. I could just make out the vague, shadowy figures riding atop them, and I briefly wondered whether they would be able to see me if they were to shine their lights in my direction. I rubbed my eyes. They felt tender to the touch, and I could scarcely keep them open. How I wished for the warm comfort of my bed in those hours. How I wished I'd never checked on Harold. It would have been better for me, better for everyone, if I'd only left him be. The urge to leave that place was ever growing, ruminating, and murmurs. Some of the group wanted to inspect the city, still transfixed by its spell, while others wanted to leave. It seemed the half that wished to carry forward had it in their heads that the only way out was through. Margaret was one of the more vocal about deserting whatever horrors lurked in that place, and I was right by her. Daryl and Linus both were vehemently defending that we continue. Once everyone's rested up, we should head on, said Linus. It's just like Harold said. There's some truth to be found here. What was all that digging if not for this? Daryl, with his arms crossed, nodded alongside Linus. I shook my head. There's no reason for it. We've been duped, guys. Harold didn't know what he was talking about. He was grieving. There was no reason for us to jump in and start digging, too. What were we even doing it for? This was true. I couldn't even remember why I decided to help dig in the first place. It was all so pointless. That's Bubkiss, said Linus. And you know it just as well as I do. It's a general discontent with the state of affairs that's brought us here. And I only intend to resurface once I've found the purpose I've been looking for all my life. There's a, a magic to this place, and it exists for a reason. It would have been nice if that were true, but looking around at the deep shadows of the massive cavern, I could only see desolation. Margaret cut in. 
I don't care what you do. I'm going back. She studied the group. Those of you that want to leave can come with me or not. The mixed expressions of hopefulness and fear made me sick. It seemed that we were destined to split up with half of us going on and half of us going back. I only hoped in that moment that we'd actually be able to find our way out of the cavern. Just as it seemed that Linus was going to respond, the first fish fell from the cavernous ceiling. It was some cod. Upon seeing it there, I blinked to make sure I'd not merely conjured it from my imagination. It came from seemingly nowhere at all, but it landed on the flat ground in the center of us gathered. It flopped and its mouth sucked and puckered at nothing as it reversed round. I reached a timid foot forward to nudge it with my shoe as Margaret peered up at the ceiling. As the words, where did that come from, came from my mouth, another fish fell directly onto Margaret's upturned face. She shrieked and kicked the thing away. Within minutes, wet plods surrounded us as it began to rain down a waterfall torrent of ocean fish. A flounder bounced off my shoulder, slapping me with its tail. We took up with our arms over our heads to cover ourselves from the incoming barrage of sea animals. It was the most insane thing I'd seen in my entire life. The air smelled of salt and the pattering of the fish landing on the ground is a noise I wouldn't soon forget. The screams of my fellow human echoed all around barely above the sounds of the fish storm. We began to take cover near the great flat rock. I dove across people and wriggling fish to reach it, pushing and shoving and getting shoved in return. In a panic, my shoulder met the rock and I turned to look back at my neighbors frantically searching for shelter. In the uproar, I could see that Daryl was fighting with something clinging to his face as it wrapped its snaky limbs around his throat. He attempted to wrench the thing off, but... It only pulled itself more tightly around him. It took far too long for my brain to realize what I was seeing. The thing holding itself to Daryl was an octopus with a head roughly the size of a Doberman. No one came to his aid and he quickly fell to his knees. The last few screeching breaths left his lungs. I watched on and concentrated frozen terror through the last few still-lit flickering torchlights as Daryl's right hand came up in an arched claw to dig into the thing's chewy flesh and then Daryl went still altogether. Margaret launched towards the thing, totally ignoring the falling fish, arching an axe as she might a baseball bat, and swatted the octopus off Daryl's prone head. Snapping out of it, I sped forward, grabbing a hold of Daryl's wrists and grabbing him to the relative safety of the big rock as Margaret stood guard. He did not kick or scream, and I wished that he were only unconscious. As Margaret returned to the shelter of the rock, we went to shine a light on Daryl. His face was no longer a face, but a skull with open optic holes through which only pink brain could be seen. I recoiled. That's not normal, said Margaret, shaking her head and kicking the rock face as she planted a flat hand against it. Looking back now, I think to myself what a strange thing that is to say. But in dire circumstances, the thing that needs to be said is so far from one's grasp that it too becomes fleeting, illusory, and there is nothing save the obvious and concrete. No, this was not normal. What are we going to do? My voice was small, caught in my throat. I was surprised that anyone could hear me over the sound of the fish rain, but Linus did. We move to the city where it's safe. There's no going back now. It wants us here. Even with the mad twinkle in his eye, I could nearly hear the fear in his voice. What exactly it was, and why it wanted us here, I couldn't say. We stayed pressed to the rock till the fish stopped falling. By the time they did, we were nearly up to our knees in them. Their dead eyes looked up at us, and sometimes their tails would twitch, forcing me to double-take and make sure there was not another tentacled creature among them. As we pushed on, stepping over or around the dying and dead fish, we came to a flat, open area of ground that encompassed the city of Spires. It seemed it had been intentionally worn down. With every step, I felt we were more vulnerable. A spotlight from one of those horrid watchers passed over us as we marched, and I could nearly feel the heat off it. We froze, and the watcher ignored us, pivoting the light in another direction. I wondered if it could even sense our presence at all. My legs began to feel heavy, my arms too. But this wasn't the normal sort of tiredness I'd been experiencing up until that point. It felt as though I'd been drugged. 
looking around at my neighbors as we went, I could sense a daze in them as well. I watched as their limbs moved in slow motion, and it occurred to me that we were hardly making any leeway whatsoever. Does anyone else feel tired? I asked. Yeah. I twisted my head around to see it was Linus. Now that you mention it, I am really feeling tired. It's like all I want to do is lay down and sleep. God, I've never felt like this before. I felt like someone was trying to pull my eyelids closed with pinched fingers. Something was amiss. The city of spires ahead grew foggy and the fires that illuminated it flickered. No. I was blinking. The slow blink of someone on the verge of sleep. Someone's cries met my ears. I turned my head to the right to see the Terry was sliding his feet along the smooth stone floor. Why'd Rogers have to die? It should have been me. He said the words so much like facts, while his ankles shifted forward in stumbling steps. The pickaxe he carried grinded along the floor of the cavern as he dragged it with a limp wrist by the handle. A chorus of other tools soon followed as we all began to carry our tools this way. Terry's eyes welled up with tears. I should have died. He was losing his mind. It was all too much. No amount of what I said would be able to snap him out of it. He was giving up. He choked. I just want to die. It was the wail of a dying critter. Hey, I tried. It's going to be all right, Terry. It's going to be okay. Just push on. Don't give up. We're going to make it out of here. No. For the briefest of moments, his eyes grew lucid as they met mine. No, we're not, Clay. That's okay, though. I'm just going to lie down for a little while. I heard the handle of his pickaxe clang against the floor. He was no longer dragging it. I'm just going to lie down and catch up with you later, all right? Don't do that. I tried shaking my head quickly to jumpstart myself out of the strange affliction. Margaret called out from somewhere behind. Don't go to sleep. She sounded like she was having a hard time speaking. It's trying to make us go to sleep. I'm... Terry fell to his knees. Just gonna close my eyes. It'll all be over soon enough. He fell onto the solid ground with a dull thud. Another body ahead of me fell. It was the lady who ran the salon down the road. I could never remember her name. Then someone else off to the left. It wasn't long till we were dropping like flies. Every thud of a body on the hard ground was another stake to the heart. It made me wonder how long I would last. Margaret called out from somewhere behind again. Clay? You, you still awake up there? Yeah, I'm still here. I don't know how much longer I'm going to make it, Clay. Can you do me a favor? I have a granddaughter. If, if you make it out of here, will you tell her I love her? There were a series of snuffles. Will you tell her I love her and that I'm sorry I couldn't see her grow to a woman? Can you do that for me? No. I was surprised how much command I still had over my own voice. Even though I could no longer turn my head to look behind, and could only see the rotating watchers and city behind, I did not want to lose Margaret. I can't do that. Because you're... You're going to make it out of here, same as me, you hear me? A few more bodies struck the ground, and the sound of my own heartbeat in my ears was the only thing for miles. I waited and waited and waited for her response. Every step forward I took was met with nothing but the sounds of my neighbors dropping. Was she already asleep? Had she succumbed to the wicked magic of the cavern? Was I the last one standing? this become my eternity walking toward a dark city suspended in infinite time? Okay, Clay, said Margaret. At hearing her voice, I felt a new strength in my legs, and even as my muscles met resistance like I was pushing through water, I began stomping defiantly towards the watchers. 
and the sounds of others' footfalls came too. Then the sinking feeling I'd had in the pit of my stomach began to disappear and I was sprinting. I'd broken the threshold of the spell, it seemed. As my muscles felt normal once more, I stopped and turned around. Laid out before me was mostly bodies. The only ones left were me and Margaret and Linus. He pushed on, slapping his face while she blinked repeatedly and rubbed her eyes. I've never felt anything like that before, said Linus. I can't believe I made it. There was nearly a cheeriness in his voice till he met me and looked out onto the bodies. The many dead forms of the group fallen behind. My God, said Margaret. Red tendrils spilled from the dark recesses of the ceiling, reaching for the extremities of the dead or sleeping, and suspended them in midair like puppets for a moment before carefully, almost delicately pulling them up and from our eyes into the shadows. As the bodies disappeared to the ceiling, a sound followed. The sound of grinding bones, of stripping wet, of those creatures above devouring them. There was nothing left in that open stone field but the torches and tools they left behind. I bit my lips shut to keep from screaming. It wasn't much further till we passed the watcher's patrol, and there were only three of us left. We were all as good as dead. This is fucking madness, said Linus, shaking his head. I can't believe any of it. He was right. I couldn't believe it either. I couldn't believe any of it. Margaret was busy examining the Prussian blue walls of the firelit city as one of the watchers stomped their spindly legs over us, giving me a perfect view of the undercarriage of its bulbous top. Beneath what must have been a cabin with some fashion of mechanisms, were twisting tubes that pulsated as though they were attempting to emulate the bladders of a living thing. The watcher's spotlight illuminated the faraway darkness in a perfect circle as it lifted its foot once more to proceed in its never-ending patrol. At the base of those thin legs were wide, bird-like appendages precariously balancing its top-heavy body. The screech of unseen gears broke the silence. It passed over like we were nothing more than inconsequential bugs. Jesus, I said, glancing over to see that Margaret, too, had removed herself from the wall. She turned her face up to the thing. We looked at each other with our mouths hanging open. What are these things? Margaret shook her head. Linus interjected. Big assholes, he spat. There was a new air about him, unreserved. More than anything else, it made me extremely uncomfortable to meet his eyes. Something was amiss there inside Linus. It was more than a vigor, the thing humans find in extenuating situations. It was like he'd lost something along the way. A piece of him was gone. And it was only then that I could see it. Why are you looking at me like that? He grinned at me, as though we'd not just witnessed the death of half the godforsaken neighborhood. No reason. I wiped my nose. Damnable cold. Just tired. Margaret lifted her axe over her head as she stretched. The wall's too high to climb. Looks like we'll have to go around until we find an opening. Though, there was a pause that hung in the wet air. I'm not so sure we should. I looked to the general direction I thought we'd perhaps enter at the cavern, and then at the vibrant blue color of the city walls. I don't think we'd make it back if we tried. I could not vouch for the other two, but I was uncertain that I'd be able to walk back through whatever aura protected the place. Not for the first or last time, I silently admonished myself for encouraging Harold. This was a hell of my own design. I brought it on myself, after all. I would brought it on us all. Linus, with those wild, mad eyes, grinned. Clay's right. Only way is through. That's what we've got to do. It's the only thing that makes sense. In fact, I don't think anything has ever made more sense in this whole crazy world to me. Margaret looked to me, shooting me a glare that told me I probably shouldn't be saying things like that around Linus. But then her shoulders relaxed and she sighed, 
puffing up a wild gray strand of hair as she did so, before shaking her head. I can't believe I'm saying this, but you're probably right. This is the dumbest thing I've ever done. Nonsense, said Linus. Look at this place. He put his arms up to accentuate his point. It's beautiful. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. How many people do you think have ever seen anything like this before? Too many, said Margaret. A smirk took over Linus's lower face. I'm telling you, he was grinning like a maniac. There was something going on there, but for the life of me, I could not figure out what it was. Something was wrong with him. I've read things about the Uncanny Valley, and I feel as though that's the best way I can describe it. He was no longer the friendly neighborhood barbecue connoisseur. It was like a new thing had jumped into him, and whether it was the dark magic of the place or his own mind that had done it, I don't know till this day. We took off to the right, following along the curvature of the city's outer wall, Linus brushing the ends of his fingers intimately over its surface as we went while me and Margaret studied him. The huge open cavern shouldn't have felt so claustrophobic, but it did. The darkness lingering over our heads where the foul creatures hid, clinging to the ceiling, forced my chest to tighten. It felt harder to breathe. Or perhaps it was just my clogged nose. I skirted away from the line we'd created as we walked to blow my nostrils open with my finger. Under any other circumstances, I may have been embarrassed, but something told me we were far beyond that. So many had already died. I glanced to my two traveling companions and hoped I would not have to see any more suffering, but could sense that was unlikely. I rejoined them, and no one mentioned a thing. They instead opted to stare ahead without saying a word. The three of us had gone perhaps twenty minutes in silence before Margaret began to fall behind, taking slower steps and keeping a distance behind us of about fifteen yards. "'What's keeping you back there?' asked Linus. Margaret waved us off. "'Just not as young and spry as I used to be, is all. Nothing to worry about. I think I just need to catch my breath.' I went to her and touched her on the shoulder. "'It's all right. We can take a break if you need to.' She latched onto my hand and pulled me close, whispering in my ear. "'Keep an eye on him. I don't trust him.' Before I could even respond, she shoved me away. Linus took his hand off the wall and turned completely around. What are you two talking about back there? Margaret offered a smile. Nothing. Clay was just asking me if I needed a break. I'm fine. He raised an eyebrow at the pair of us. Okay. Then he placed his hand on the wall again, possession taking over his steps. It wasn't long until Margaret fell in line with us once again. I couldn't get what she'd said to me out of my mind. Until that point, I'd been worried I was the only one noticing Linus's strange behavior. This should have served to quell the anxieties I had of him, but it only made it so they flourished. I kept him in my eye line. A patrolling watcher stepped over us, and we stopped to let it pass. I could see them a million times in my dreams, and they would never cease being alien to me. In fact, I have, and they remain that way. The watcher's strange bulb briefly lit the high ceiling as it shifted up, and I could see a mess of wicked things tightly bound skin and faces sewn in frozen torment served as an appropriate juxtaposition to the Sistine Chapel. Before I could check to see if the faces matched any of the ones we'd left behind, the Watcher groaned in its mechanical way and left. Linus was smiling. Beautiful. A shiver went up my spine. I think I see the entrance up ahead, said Margaret. Squinting, I could see she was right. Just around a bend, the wall opened. How long had we been walking? The repetitive nature of our footfalls had long since taken me off to another place like hypnosis. If not for her signaling it, I might have walked right past it. The archway was magnificently tall, constructed from an assortment of cyclopean stones. I was left to wonder exactly what sort of creature could have carved them. I could not have imagined the Watchers doing so, urging the massive stone blocks across the ground with their thin legs. No. It seemed to me that there was only one explanation. They were of an ancient imagination, withdrawn from the recesses of a mind far gone. 
We passed through the archway only to be met by the ruins of a lost civilization. I was immediately struck by the dizzying way the walkways spun through the spired structures. The streets, if one could call them that, were worn thin as though they'd been once traversed by living things. My mind went to the Sumerian cities created long ago, and I wondered if perhaps this was something similar. I knew this not to be the case. No human would have found comfort in that place. No sane human, anyhow. The inner side of the wall surrounding the city was onyx black so dark that I felt if I were to reach out and touch it I might fall directly into it. Linus whistled up at the tall buildings that seemed to have no entranceways of their own. It was as though they were nothing more than hollowed-out slabs. Who would construct buildings that could never be used? You guys ever see anything like this? he asked. No, said Margaret. As we passed by the massive thorny building striking up at the ceiling of the cavern, we were cast in shadows. Margaret and I both removed flashlights, but it hardly cut through the blackness ahead. It was a constant fear that something would slither from the darkness and snatch us away to some torturous fate. Thinking of the faces I'd seen in the ceiling, I felt my arms spring alive with goose flesh. Linus caught my uneasiness, and he reached out to pat me on the shoulder. I flinched. Whoa, he said. Calm down there, good buddy. There's no reason to be so jumpy. I'm not, I shrugged while turning my attention back to the shadows in front of us. I'm fine. We moved by the first few structures, glancing down the snaking, thin alleyways, but deciding in our silence to continue our way down the street we were on. Each time we met one of these openings on either side where the buildings broke open to those dark corners of the city, I could feel unreal eyes on me. I felt so totally vulnerable in those moments, like my lungs might rupture and exhaust all the oxygen from my body. But we pushed on and the spires opened up to some kind of abandoned market square where flame lights flickered the shadows away. Among the torchlights were booths where people had once sold wares, and I was once again confronted by the fact that some intelligent life had in fact dwelled there sometime in the distant past. In the center of the square was a massive black tower that rose well above all else. Everything was silent but our own steps for a blinking moment. A single fish fell from the sky and landed near the black spire. Linus went to it, and Margaret and I both followed him. He hunkered down over it and prodded it with the end of his index finger, and then looked over his shoulder. Again? He asked, apparently to no one. Linus stood and looked to the black expanse above. We've seen this already, he shouted, and his voice echoed back at him. Did you hear me? You've already done this. Whether or not Linus summoned what was to follow, I'm unsure but when I look back on the words I've written so far, I want nothing more than to reach through the words and throttle him. There's no changing the past. A great groaning escaped from somewhere in the shadows overhead, and I half expected the great red tentacle beasts from above to come down and make us their playthings, but they did not. Instead, shattering glass rained from above. I was left frozen as the shards seemed to materialize from seemingly nothing. I put my arms over my head and hurried to the black spire, hoping to find some cover from the fallen glass. But the tower did a little. A few darting shards caught my legs, but I felt nothing through the rush of adrenaline. Linus stood in the center of the market, face up, screaming. His voice could scarcely be heard over the shattering glass. As he twisted around, gripping his face, I could see that a thorn of glass had driven its way into his left eye. Blood rushed down the front of his shirt. Margaret clung to me and I to her. Shit, shit, shit! She was yelling directly into my ear, eyes clenched shut and fingers digging into my arm. I began feeling around the wall of the flat-sided tower as we inched our way around it. My fingers met an opening and I pulled Margaret in there with me. We fell in and she scrambled in the dark to withdraw her flashlight while I peered out from the crevice in the tower to scream towards Linus. I saw him dancing in the square with his hands at his face. Over here! Come over here! As the words left my mouth, Linus twisted to face me, and I caught another good look at the gory mess. He latched a hand onto the shard of glass jutting from his eye, and his fingers slid down the sharpened edge of it, cutting his hand and causing it to slip as he attempted to pry it from his face. He latched on with both hands and finally launched the thing from his eye socket. I did it, he said, torrents of blood rushing from his head. 
the glass rain did not let up, and he seemed not to even notice as it diced his exposed arms to flayed ribbons that hung off him in cords, exposing the tissue beneath. Linus! I was too late. The ship's mast fell from the ceiling, landing directly on top of him. It crushed him, and I recoiled back into the dark recesses of the crevice we'd found. My stomach lurched, thinking of the way he'd become no more than a stain. The sound of clinking glass continued, and I dared to peek once more, ignoring the spot where Linus's raspberry squashed remains were. There, crashing over the towering structures and sending up plumes of debris and hunks of stone, was the bow of a ship whirling through the air. Margaret looked at me, dark circles forming around her eyes that I'm sure I reciprocated. A handful of short red streaks ran the length of her face where the glass had caught her. A stinging soreness in my own cheeks confirmed that I must have looked much the same. The stress we'd been under was beginning to take its toll. It's just you and me now, I informed her. The frankness with which I delivered the news scared me. I know, she sighed. There's stairs over there. I grabbed her by the shoulders. We're both going to make it out of here, aren't we? When had I started shaking her? She ripped herself out of my hands. Clay, goddammit, get off of me! I caught her stern expression, but it was quickly replaced by a look of concern. You're not going to start acting crazy too, are you? My shoulders slumped. No. I shook my head. I just don't want anyone else to die. Margaret grabbed my face. Her cold, bony hands grounded me. I'm not going to die. You're not going to die. All right? I was losing my mind. She was right. I, I, I couldn't be thinking like that. It would do neither one of us any good. She shone her light into the shadows to reveal a plain, carved staircase that spiraled up through the center of the spire. I choked out my words. I don't want to keep going. She shifted to shine the light on me. I felt extraordinarily small when she did that. I don't think we have any choice in the matter. The shattering of the glass just beyond the open doorway and the splintering hull of the wooden ship flying through the air drove away my final protests. We were going on, and we had no choice. But to what end? What did we hope to find? There would be no way out. The stairs seemed to go on forever, and it felt as though there was a physical presence pulling me, weighing me down. Margaret's heels kicked high as she ascended the steps ahead of me with the axe out in front of her chest. Our flashlights illuminated the small space we traveled through. The higher we went in the spire, the closer the walls around us grew, as though the building tapered near the top. My chest grew tighter with my cold working against me. I believe in that climb of that staircase I became delirious. I tried with my spare hand to feel my forehead, hoping that I'd not come down with a blistering fever. But somehow that felt ridiculous. Who cared if that was the case? I couldn't imagine that it would matter. What would happen if I were to just take a seat on one of those steps and refuse to continue? With everything in me, I believe I could have taken a seat and died. Wasting away in a dark tower would have been a fate less abominable than the unimaginable horrors beyond, surely. I'm afraid that if I had not had Margaret ahead of me, pushing on with her wiry, persistent limbs, that may have been what happened. Whatever the opposite of concentration, that's what I found in those lingering, dark moments in the stairwell. It became a steady zombie walk of doom, where living ceased being a thing and there was only movement. The repetition of it lulled me to a place in my mind where things were better. On our way up, we went by slitted openings in the stone like ancient fortress windows that allowed us to look upon the city of twisted buildings. The glass had stopped coming down. I could no longer hear the sound of the ship crashing over rooftops. Somehow the silence was worse. Things would never be the same. I would forever remember that place in those quiet nights I'd find my eyes going out of focus. Daydreaming would become a thing of the long-forgotten past, because I would always be returned there when imagination came. Are you all right? asked Margaret without looking over her shoulder or slowing her pace. I think so. Just making sure I'm not alone. I know what you mean. 
She angled her pace around the middle pillar of the stairwell, ever tightening its bend. What if there's no end? What do you mean? I mean, what if it goes on forever? There's always an end. My mind was programmed from a lifetime of constructed narratives that forced a sense of purpose on me and my actions. There's always an end. How do you know? What if we just keep going on forever? Her voice was shaking. I don't think that's going to happen, I hoped aloud. That's, that's not how it works. We're going to get out of this, remember? Just like we talked about. You and me, Will. I really hope you're right. I know I am. I said this in the most reassuring way that I could without actually believing it. Even if I wanted to. She stopped. I think I see it. The opening. It's just up ahead. There was hope in their voice that twisted my entrails. The truth was evident. Beyond her silhouetted shoulder, I could spy dancing warm light. Our pace quickened as we broke the surface at the pinnacle of the spire. I slammed into her without meaning to. We were holding hands not as lovers, but as humans. Because we were scared. At the clean, flat top that stretched to a diameter of twenty yards, we stood together aghast at the creature there. The unmoving, half-human-seeming thing gurgled as its chest rose and fell. It sat in a chair of the same onyx I'd seen on the inner wall of the city, like it was made of a bitter, sick soul. We wagered a few steps towards the thing lined in rows of standing torches. Its eyes were wide open, white, forgotten by sunlight so the pupils and irises had taken on a milky blue quality. The thing's arms were snapped into the chair, black snaking tubes gored into the forearms, frozen so hard that it could not move. The opposite ends of the tubes snaked into the ceiling. It stared directly up to the dark shadows or clouds above. Not even its mouth was free of its own cord that no doubt plumbed the depths of its stomach. As we grew nearer, I could see dry tear stains trace the creases of its crow's feet. And its beard was no longer full, but kinked and thinned from duress. Harold? I choked out. The thing in the seat did not respond to my voice. On approach, I could see the reason for this. Its ears had been clogged and locked in place by those same black tubes. My God, hushed Margaret. We went to Harold then, not knowing what to do. As I touched his cool, naked skin, he seemed to respond in a mumble groan around the thin tube trapped in his throat. Why was I crying? I reached for one of the tubes while Margaret watched me with steady eyes. Neither of us knew what to do, but that was not going to stop me from doing what came next. It was a panic that had jumped into my fingers as I clawed at one of the tubes in his left arm. I yanked it, and he let out an awful scream as sludge shot from the place I'd freed the tube, spraying me in the face. I let it fall to the side, totally stunned. What was I going to do? Would he die if I pulled him from the chair? Was he too far gone? Then a whirring began that echoed. The sound of suction filled my ears, and I watched in horror as the tubes attached to Harold began sucking something out of him. His eyes closed and he cried whimpering tears. I could not see through the vacant black tubes and to this day I do not know what it drew from him. But when the silence came it was maddening. Margaret looked at me. She held her hands to her forehead, perpetually swiping her hair back in a frantic manner. What's happening? Jesus Christ, what's happening? And then it began to rain again. No, not rain. It hailed, and thousands of pinking little balls fell from that black sky and rained down on our heads. I closed my eyes and went to Margaret, and we tried our best to shield one another from what came, screaming like we'd screamed in that place so many times already. The twinkling glow caught my eyes as it gathered around our feet, and I could see that the hail was not ice or rocks, but they were made of gold. I snapped from my terror and brought one of them up and held it to my face. Through squinted eyes, Margaret shouted at me, What are you doing? I held up the circle. They're... wedding bands. She opened her eyes and looked through the hole in the center of the ring I was holding. 
I glanced toward Harold. This is his place, I think. What? There are things darker in the human mind than there are out there in space. No dark gods compare to the inner workings of a human mind. The potentiality of our own terribleness cannot be overstated. Those previous sentences are a post-rationalization. In that moment, I couldn't put the words in place like that. I simply shook my head and dropped the ring. I don't know. The rings came down, and I pattered to the opening at the top of the spire toward the way we'd already come. Margaret had been right. There was no end. But I was going to try, even if it killed me. Her fingers dug into my arm, and she whipped me around. We can't leave him. She glanced over at the thing in the chair, still sputtering, gasping for air around the tube fixed in his lips. Not like that. There was a pause before she looked back to me. I wouldn't want to be left like that, would you? I looked to the axe in her hand. How was it that she'd kept it so long? Through everything? Not like that. We can't do it like that. We were screaming to one another over the clinking of the metal rain. What choice is there? Her fingers tightened around the handle of the axe. I... We could do it quick. I looked to the pitiful herald and nodded. She moved quickly. It was a task no one wanted a part in, and the faster it was over, the better. Margaret launched the axe into his chest with a quick heave. His body lurched and spasmed before going still. She ripped the axe away, and blood sprayed as his chest opened wide. The wedding ring stopped falling, with the last few ringing out somewhere far away. All was quiet with Margaret covered in Harold's blood like war paint. The cavern air changed. There was nothing. We were standing in a vacuum that might crush us at any moment. Then the world began crumbling. A cave-in was my initial thought. That, that was ridiculous, of course. Cave-ins didn't happen in places that didn't exist. Such tragedies were for the real world. We parted there long ago. The world was shaking. The spire trembled, threatening to give away at any moment. The rumbling was all I could hear. Margaret screeched out something, but I couldn't understand. She hung onto the edge of one of the tubes attached to Harold's body. She was waving at me. I stumbled over and fell onto my knees, trying to crawl to her. Her mouth moved as I tried deciphering what she was saying, and a great boulder fell from the sky and sheared away the opening of the stairwell behind me. I twisted around on my back to watch it fall away as spider crack lines shot in my direction. I'm certain I was screaming as I moved. I felt a pair of ice-cold hands on my neck and craned around to see Margaret. She screamed over the roar of the falling debris. I can see light! She pointed in the most unexpected of directions. She pointed at Harold's chest. She shifted to the front of him that had been pried open by the axe. I watched dumbfounded as she pushed her fingers into his chest and opened them more. Indeed, natural light spilled from there. I was immediately reminded of the mumbles of my dead neighbors. The only way was through, so they said. Margaret placed her knee on his thigh and ripped his chest open. I crawled over on shaking arms and pulled myself up to gander in. It was a dream. That I could see trees and perhaps even a touch of real air. I am not proud of this. I pushed my fist into him and began worming my way in. Freedom was so close I could nearly taste it. Swimming in the visceral ooze in the place between here and there is a feeling I will never wash clean. Digging my claws in, I propelled myself forward like a deranged newborn pulling itself free from its tense mother. There was no longer a Harold or Margaret or even me. There was only the ravenous, growing urge to escape. And I kicked my way through intestines until I tugged away at clumps of dirt and took in labored breaths of fresh air. The sun splintered overhead as I sat choking in the open hole of Harold's front yard. I hawked up a lump of wet mud and scooted onto my knees to peer into the place I'd come from. There was no opening leading back there anymore, and its place there was only a grouping of loose dirt. 
I watched and waited and was all alone. I wept and swiped tears away with dry, cracked hands. Come on, I said at the pile. Come on. The words spit from my mouth. The dirt remained still with no trace of life. Please, I begged whatever it was that had created such a cruel world. I screamed like a madman. It started out small. The pebbles of minuscule bald clay fell away and rolled like children down a grassy hill. A finger with splintered caked nails sprang forth. And then came the whole hand and the forearm. I wrapped my hands around the thin wrist and tugged with everything I had. And Margaret's head came forth. Hair clinging to her head. She gasped, open mouthed and eyes closed. Once she was free, she wiped at her face. After a brief coughing fit where she put her head between her knees as I patted her on the back, she began crying. We made it, I said, the elation in my voice reaching a point of absurdity. There's no reason for that anymore. We made it. She looked at me. I know. Margaret patted the dust off her shirt. There was a time in there I saw your feet just above my head. I saw you kicking. You were going to make it out, then I felt something grab me from behind, and I was stuck. Then your feet disappeared, and I couldn't move anymore. I almost died. I could feel whatever it was squeezing the life out of me. There was a thought I had, though. I looked at her, puzzled. At least you were going to make it out. That's what I thought. That'd be something, at least. Margaret... I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't. We sat there, curled up on that spot in the bottom of the pit for too long. There was an investigation into the matter by the police. You can't have half a neighborhood disappear without it raising a few eyebrows. Neither me nor Margaret told the whole story. But the police received what we knew they'd believe. There was a mania caught among the crowd of people gathered in Harold's front yard. And we couldn't stop digging. We told them that much, and that much was enough. The official record went that we were victims of hysteria. We told them of a cave-in, and that most of the people were caught in it. They excavated the lot, Harold's house stood on, and never found a thing. I never figured they would. We each got our share of fines and community service. In the courtroom, I recall the judge sneering at me from her high chair as I pled my case. There was jail time for me, but Margaret's lawyer was better. She visited me sometimes. It was time well spent in comparison to what I'd seen. When I got out, Margaret introduced me to her granddaughter. As me and the old lady who once jogged around the neighborhood grew closer, I came to realize her granddaughter was all she had left. And it finally made sense to me that her last request would have something to do with her. We don't talk about that place often. But when we do, it always ends in long nights, where we chat over four or five bottles of wine or whatever else is nearby. She's a fair amount older than I am, and I know that I'll be the last, unless by some miracle the old bird outlives us all. Given what she's capable of, I would believe it's possible. I joke like that to make it seem far and away. Do not let this serve as some fable of morals or fault. It was never about blame, anyhow. This was about one man's inability to let go of the past. Tonight's story was written by the talented Lucas Worley. You can find uh, Lucas's work on Reddit under his profile, Edward the Crazy Man, all one word. And he's also published a few books on Amazon under his real name, Lucas Worley. That's W-H-O-R-L-E-Y. And I own a couple of his books. I've read them. They're really good. And can't say enough good things about Lucas as a writer. And his stuff on Reddit is, is also excellent as well. He's uh, one of the first writers that I really got into on Reddit. And I appreciate him letting me read this story on the channel. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, 
Marcus Wall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Blair Ann 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Robert Turner, Bajani Aspinall. If you'd like help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, you'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you, which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow, and see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.